So, the first installment of Netflix's Castlevania series has come to a close. And what a close it was. Dear God. <laughs> the yearning, the raw intimacy, the pure romance and hope. Y'all, y'all, I'm too fucking queer for this. Obligatory warning for blood and gore, I'm gonna try to keep the grisly visuals to a minimum, but this is Castlevania. Anyway, I sat down recently to watch the final season of Netflix's Castlevania, which is a very good show, I highly recommend it. Again, bear in mind, very gory. I would never in a million years have watched it if I didn't love the characters so damn much. Even with that, I had to get very good at knowing when to strategically avert my eyes to avoid visuals that would trigger some truly unpleasant intrusive thoughts. But enough about that, let's talk about the fourth season, how it ended, and the raw intimacy of holding someone's hand. Yes, this is an incredibly queer take, but I am incredibly queer, so that's almost a given. <laughs> So, season 4 has a very interesting, very touching relationship with specifically the act of hand-holding. It's presented almost as an ultimate sign of care and trust. This is heightened further by the fact that there isn't a single kiss anywhere in the whole season. We have three canon-confirmed couples and one strongly implied polycule, but there's not a single kiss anywhere to be seen. So other forms of expressing affection are allowed to shine all the brighter in that absence. Primarily hand-holding, but there is a forehead touch in there, and dear god, the expressions of affection this season melted me to my core. Yes, I am asexual, why do you ask? There are a couple instances I want to highlight here, so let's start with Striga and Morana. They're a well-established couple, and I am so relieved that for once, the lesbians get to live. They get to live and strike off on their own and build a future with each other, because as long as they have one another, that's all they really need. And after that, what's the plan? What if there isn't a plan? What if it's just you and I? I think... I think I might be alright with that. It's such a beautiful ending, especially for two antagonists. I hadn't really put much thought into what their ending might be, but some small part of me had definitely assumed, almost subconsciously, that either one or both of them would die. But no, instead they get the closest thing to a peaceful ending out of any true antagonist in the show. And I love that! The second pair I want to touch on are Hector and Isaac. Or really Hector in general, because there are so many interesting things to observe about his relationships this season. Especially as developments from earlier seasons. Now, no matter how you choose to read their relationship, and I will admit, before the end of this season, I couldn't really see what the fandom was on about in regards to the Forge husband's ship. There is no denying that the scene where Isaac and Hector reunite is deeply intimate. Honestly, watching it shook me to my core in a way I wasn't expecting. Isaac's character in this show has definite issues, what with being the only black man on the cast, and having his backstory edited specifically to make him a slave in the past, when that wasn't a thing in the games, and he was also white in the games. But I have really enjoyed watching his arc, especially in the last season. His journey to become a man with agency over his own life, a life where he can move on from Dracula and his past, is, from what I can gather, almost the antithesis of his character in the games, and dear gods do I love it. So, Isaac arrives in Styria, and Hector is fully expecting to be murdered, only to be faced with a man who has, through his travels, changed completely, managing to grow into a much healthier place mentally than he has ever been. 
Hector, when faced with Isaac, who has changed so fundamentally from the man he knew, and who is not actually here to kill him, frees himself, and thus clears the way for Isaac to reach and take out Carmilla. He cuts off his own finger to do so. He does it with Isaac's knife, which Isaac then uses to cauterize the wound, before heading off to do just that. It's a short moment, but undeniably powerful. Understandably, Hector is a little shaken by this, but the most important moment, to me, is this one after Isaac has returned. I can't really show you the whole thing because it's so long, but this is one of the most important bits. But that... I... I've been working towards this for weeks. Of course you have. You feel guilt. You want redemption. I want to mend my mistakes. The mistakes you have suffered for. That said, Hector, you had no agency in those events. You were manipulated. You were used as a tool for leverage by those who are truly responsible for the end of Dracula. You believe that? I've had a lot of time to put it all together and think it all over. Do you know, I've even been talking to other people. Actual living people. Well, mostly. No matter how you read their relationship, it's obvious that Hector and Isaac care for each other in some manner, and quite possibly their futures lie together. After all, Isaac wants to build a way of living, a future, and while Hector does want to be left alone, he also wants to make things. Their paths in life seem well matched. What's more notable to me, though, is the contrast of this with Hector's relationship with Lenore. Never once until the very end of the season do they even touch, never mind holding hands, despite being, in the loosest possible terms, in a relationship. A horribly abusive relationship where the power balance is all kinds of messed up, and Hector's sunk into that place of, it's not bad right now, which means it's good, but still. When Hector finally does reach out to take Lenore's hand, it's largely one-sided. He tries to cling to her, a final last-ditch effort to get her to stay, but yet she pulls away. Hector and Lenore do not have a healthy relationship. She spent all of last season manipulating him, luring him into a false sense of security, into believing she truly cared for him, before she used the first time they had sex to put a magical leash on his power, effectively turning him into a slave. Which, yes, does make it sexual assault. In the gap between seasons, Hector's been working on a way to escape, but his attitude to Lenore seemingly fell into almost fondness tinged with bitterness, which makes sense. She's his abuser, and she is terrifyingly good at what she does. So part of Hector's request to Isaac is to let Lenore live, which he grants. But, of course, Lenore can't stand that idea. The thought of living in captivity with no control over her situation in life. I don't know, truly, if she ever cared for Hector. A little, perhaps, given she argued in his favor against Carmilla, albeit incredibly condescendingly. More like one would care for a pet than a partner. But in the end, where Isaac explicitly chooses to live, Lenore chooses to die, further contrasting their presences in Hector's life. Isaac is a liberator, Someone who extends his hand and means it genuinely. He is the future. Lenore is a captor who extended her hand while hiding a knife behind her back. She is the past. Isaac lives, and for all that Hector tried to cling to her, Lenore dies. I'm not upset with how her suicide was depicted. She would rather die than live in captivity, and if she can get a final dig in at her captive-turned-captor with her death, then that's all the better. I think Hector's reaction here is also telling. The way he just kind of stands there, doesn't really react outwardly, 
He doesn't attempt to drag her back inside, futile as that would be given she's a vampire. It's just stillness. He saved her life, maybe even came to like or love her in some way, but that doesn't change the inherently abusive nature of their relationship, and some part of him understands that. So, really, I am glad that she died. Or, well, I'm glad she's out of his life. Because that's what he needs to really move forward and heal. I wish she hadn't committed suicide in front of him, because that's another thing he's gonna have to heal from. But, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if she did that on purpose. God knows he deserves some rest. The poor man has been through way too much. And speaking of characters who have been through way too much... Alucard, my love, the character who several times made me swear the animators were targeting me in particular. Dear gods, that hair. The epilogue episode was just filled with tender touches between him and Greta and Sypha and Trevor. I kind of get where some people are coming from, complaining that Greta's presence in the show indicates an attempt to split up the fandom's favorite ship of Alucard, Sypha, and Trevor, into two distinctly separate, neatly heterosexual couples, and I'd be inclined to agree if it wasn't for literally all of this. Also, let's not forget that Greta is actually canonically both bi and polyam, and technically Alucard's supposed to be too, I think. Like, I think that scene at the end of season 3 was supposed to confirm for us that he's at least bi, but honestly, even before it turned into outright sexual assault, the whole thing just felt off, consent-wise. Alucard was in an extremely vulnerable and lonely place, and I see absolutely no indication of any kind of enthusiastic consent here. And I'm moving on now because it makes me incredibly uncomfortable. But yes, this does indeed mean that season 3 ended with not one, but two rape scenes. Which was a very nasty surprise, let me tell you. I did not walk away from that one feeling particularly good about life. Anyway, the end of season 4 finally sees fit to give him some peace, and with that peace comes Greta and Sypha and Trevor. And the village the refugees he led to the castle are building. It's honestly a better ending than I ever hoped for, given just how dark and hopeless the end of season 3 was, and the fact that they had to somehow fix all of that, and uncover and stop the plan to resurrect Dracula, all within the span of 10 episodes. <laughs> but, to their credit, they did manage it. Mostly by making Carmilla and her shenanigans decidedly not the main trio's problem. I'm getting off track. With these four, again, we're not given a single kiss, instead landing on other forms of intimacy. Hand-holding, words of comfort and reassurance, providing a shoulder to lean on, and so forth. Honestly, I'm not sure how anyone can watch this and not get smacked in the face with the almost painfully obvious Polycule vibes. These four, truly, are a stellar example of people who obviously care deeply for each other. And the writers trust us, the audience, to understand that, even without any big finale canon ceiling kiss. The closest we get is Trevor and Sypha saying I love you to each other, and the confirmation that Sypha is pregnant. Really, relationship-wise, the series is incredibly open-ended. Trevor and Sypha are established, and Alucard and Greta are heavily implied, but so is the possibility of the four of them forming a polyamorous quad. I mean, honestly, just one look at Greta gently holding Alucard's hand while she encourages him to go talk to Sypha, and attempt to get her to stay, should be enough to tell you that. A discussion during which, notably, Alucard holds Sypha's hand. And Greta's a not insignificant part of arguing in favor of Sypha staying, including this line. <laughs> And I was hoping you could help me teach this brilliant, but actually fairly useless man how to live his life. Which, honestly, maybe it's just that I'm polyamorous myself, but dear god, the vibes! And then, of course, Trevor returns to them alive after they thought he was dead for two weeks due to time corridor shenanigans. And Alucard helps him stand after he's annoyed Sypha into dropping him, and smiles perhaps his first smile of true happiness in the entire show. 
Seriously, I don't know how anyone walked away from this ending not fully expecting them all to be living together with four kids and a fifth on the way within three months max. And finally, of course, I can't do this video without talking about the only remaining entirely, definitely, on-screen confirmed with no room to doubt it couple on this show. But I also do need to add a massive spoiler warning before that, because seriously, if you have not watched this show, or you're not caught up, just pause this video and go do that before you continue. No, I'm serious, you'll want to see this on your own. Go on, I'll wait. Are you done? Great, welcome back. Let's talk about Vlad and Lisa. Man calling him Vlad feels weird. <laughs> So, yeah, that whole incident with the Rebus allowed them to come back to life. Somehow. Which, hey, I am delighted and certainly not about to look a gift horse in the mouth. Even though I'm sure the following series will make me do exactly that. Anyway, aside from making my heart melt out of my chest while positively setting my brain on fire with questions, the final cherry on top of an already stellar ending only serves to further emphasize the importance this season has placed on hands, and the intimacy of holding the hand of someone you love. We get to see Vlad and Lisa talk, wondering over their new situation while making plans for the future they never thought they would have. And instead of clutching each other close, as they always did when we saw them in hell, they lay down in a shared bed facing one another and hold hands. I honestly don't think I could have conceived of a more beautiful ending if I had tried. So, in conclusion, no matter what you choose to read the relationships as, hand-holding here really seems to signify a great depth of care, which is honestly really touching and sweet. Again, this is a very good show, and I highly recommend it if you either have a strong stomach or a good sense of when to avert your eyes. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, consider liking it and maybe subscribing. I will be back here Thursday after next.